Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Please, everybody, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd stop by. Actually, you're in the neighborhood, so I, I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, I see a lot of friends and familiar faces. Uh, I have visited a lot of the countries where you are serving. Uh, I want to thank you once again for putting up with me when I show up, because it's a lot of work. Uh, I know my visits are not easy, uh, and your teams do extraordinary work uh, in making sure that our visits are a success, and I'm deeply grateful for that. Uh, and when I depart, I am sure that you guys have big wheels up parties. <laughs> I'm confident about that. Uh, I I'm not here to give a big speech. I want to come by and mainly just say thank you. Uh, I want to reiterate what I say uh, at every embassy that I visit uh, to your entire team, uh, and that is that you are doing extraordinary work on behalf of America. Uh, and because of you, we are safer and more secure, and America's reputation around the world uh, is extraordinarily strong. Now, that starts with our Secretary of State, John Kerry. Um, we all know that John is tireless. We don't know exactly what he takes. <laughs> but 82 foreign trips so far, 80 countries, in one case, five countries in two days, more than one million miles. After a long day of negotiations in foreign capitals, he's been known to explore the finer restaurants after midnight. Uh, one staffer, who I think is more than half his age, says it's inhuman. But John is relentless because he knows, uh, as I do, that there's no substitute for American leadership. There are those who criticize our commitment to diplomacy, for investing so much effort in trying to resolve conflicts that seem intractable. But here's the truth. Conflicts and wars do not end on their own. Breakthroughs do not just happen. Agreements don't write themselves. It takes diplomacy, being willing to sit down with others, sometimes with adversaries, sometimes with people who, uh, whose values are completely contradictory to our own. Uh, but as John always says, we have to try. Uh, this uh, Secretary of State from Massachusetts follows uh, on the heels of the original JFK uh, from Massachusetts, who said, let's never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Uh, and we've seen the results. Thanks to John, but also, most importantly, thanks to so many of you. The historic democratic transition in Afghanistan, chemical weapons removed from Syria, the Iran nuclear deal, detained Americans coming home, the Paris Climate Agreement, the cessation of hostilities in the Syrian civil war. That's strong principled diplomacy at work. And so, John, on behalf of myself uh, and the American people, we want to say thank you for your leadership. Now, in addition to John, I see Tony and Gail and Heather, and, and we get to hang out all the time in the Situation Room. Uh, sometimes we get to come out for fresh air uh, and sunlight. Uh, but I know that behind them, there is an incredible team. All of you are embassies and posts in every corner of the globe. And for so many people around the world, both foreign governments and foreign publics, you are the voice and the face of the United States. So you don't just convey our interests, you represent our values, you represent our diversity, you and your teams represent the very best of America. 
and I say this before some of you when I've gone to visit, uh, you will hear me say this. Uh, when John or I arrive in a country, we make a big fuss. But ultimately, uh, what determines people's impressions of the United States is you and your teams uh, who are there in a sustained way and day in, day out uh, are helping people, whether it's a business trying to get a, a, a visa or it is a family trying to be reunited, uh, you are solving problems. Uh, and that has a ripple effect all across uh, the countries where you are serving. And I know it's not always easy. Uh, dedicated personnel have made, in some cases, the ultimate sacrifice because uh, the world can be dangerous, uh, including Chris Stevens. And since then, we've lost others in Afghanistan and uh, Smedenhof and Abdul Rahman, uh, our embassy guard in Ankara, Mustafa. Arkasu, uh, in Pakistan just this month, two locally employed staff, uh, Faisal Khan uh, and Abid Shah. So we remember and we honor their service. There are real risks involved in being a diplomat. There always have been, and uh, many of those risks are accentuated today. And I know that service can mean sacrifice for families as well. Uh, some of you serve at unaccompanied posts, which means that you are separated from your loved ones. Uh, when families deploy and spouses and children serve uh, in their own way, uh, we know that uh, they don't always hear directly from the President, so I need you to transmit to them how much we appreciate the work that they do. Let them know uh, that we know uh, they're part of the ambassadorial team as well. More broadly, I want to thank you for your partnership in what's been a priority uh, for us, and that is renewing American leadership. I believe that a broader vision of American strength that harnesses all elements of our national power, including diplomacy, uh, is what is going to make a difference in this complicated age that we live in. That's how we build a global coalition to deal with Iran. Strong sanctions plus diplomacy. And under the nuclear deal, Iran will not get its hands on a nuclear weapon. That's how we forge the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will help to rewrite the rules of trade in the region and reinforce America's rebalance to the Asia-Pacific. That's how we rally the world to stop Ebola, deploying our own personnel, military, doctors, USAID, CDC, uh, and helping our West African partners save countless lives. That's how we work with countries like China and India and nearly 200 nations to reach the Paris Agreement, the most ambitious global agreement ever to fight climate change. And diplomacy, including having the courage to turn a page on the failed policies of the past, is how we've begun a new chapter of engagement with the people of Cuba. Uh, what a historic day it was when John reopened our embassy in Havana. And next week, I look forward to being the first U.S. President to visit Cuba in nearly 90 years without uh, a battleship uh, accompanying me. Now, uh, we all know how much work we have to do. Uh, as I said, I plan to do everything that I can uh, with every minute that I have left in this office uh, to keep making progress and make the world safer more prosperous uh, and to deal with the enormous challenges that so many people uh, are burdened with around the world. We will leave it all on the field, and I'm going to need the help and the partnership of all of you as we focus on uh, some key areas coming up. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we've got to continue to keep our nation safe, especially from the threat of terrorism, and all of you have a role to play in that process. We're going to have to continue to strengthen our global coalition against ISIL, whether it's the air campaign, support for local partners, cutting off ISIL financing, preventing the flow of foreign terrorist fighters, working with partners to counter ISIL's bankrupt nihilistic ideology. We're going to have to keep pushing on the diplomatic front because that's the only way that the larger Syrian conflict will end with a political transition and an inclusive Syrian government. We're going to have to keep strengthening partnerships from West Africa, as we saw again yesterday in Cote d'Ivoire, to Afghanistan. 
These countries are battling terrorism. They need our help. And we're going to have to keep working with allies and partners to stabilize Libya and Yemen. We have to keep living up to our values and move ahead on our plan, including uh, safely transferring detainees to finally close the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we are not going to stop <laughs> making the effort to do that. So we've got to continue to fight terrorism and do so in a way that's consistent with our values. It's what we've done over these last seven and a half years. That's what we're going to continue to do. And all of you have a role to play. And all of you know uh, that uh, in the countries uh, where uh, you are working, it makes a difference when the perception is that America is abiding by its values. Uh, it makes your job easier. It makes it easier for us to uh, obtain the cooperation that we need. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done so far, but we've got some more work that we have to do. Second, we're going to have to keep mobilizing the world to meet shared challenges, and that includes strengthening international rules and norms that undergird peace and security. We're going to have to continue to ensure that Iran fully meets its commitments under the nuclear deal, to make sure that we're enforcing effective sanctions on North Korea, that at our upcoming uh, summit here in Washington, we're continuing to increase nuclear security. In Europe, with our NATO allies, we're continuing to bolster our common defenses. We are continuing to push to make sure that the Minsk agreement is upheld and that we are supporting Ukraine's right to self-determination. On climate change, we have to ensure that nations meet their Paris commitments, that the United States does so as well and that we invest in new clean energy solutions and help developing countries deal with climate change and ensuring that they do not feel they have to choose between uh, uplifting their people economically uh, and preserving the planet. We're going to have to continue to work on transnational threats uh, like cyber uh, attacks, uh, making sure that we've put in place an architecture uh, so that we have international rules governing that space and there's cooperation. Preventing epidemics uh, through our global health security agenda. Uh, making sure that uh, we are not just reacting to something like the Ebola crisis, but that we are systematically putting in place uh, the kinds of global networks uh, and uh, responses uh, that can help countries uh, not only help their own people, but also make sure that uh, at, a, at a, uh, an era of international travel and globalization that our own people are not put uh, in harm's way. And third, even as we confront threats, we've got to keep partnering with nations and people to seize the incredible opportunities of this moment in history. That means we've got to keep standing up for citizens who are striving to forge their own futures through fair and free elections and open government and insisting on the dignity of all people so that we're respecting human rights around the world. In the Asia Pacific, we've got to move ahead with our rebalance, strengthening our alliances, partnering with ASEAN, supporting the transition in Myanmar, moving ahead with TPP and ensuring security and stability in places like the South China Sea. Here in the Americas, my trip to Cuba and Argentina will underscore how we're focusing on the future, creating opportunity, growing the region's middle class, helping Colombia achieve peace, and helping Central America reduce violence and poverty. In Africa, with its enormous economic and human potential, we're going to continue to work uh, with partners to increase trade and investment, lift people out of the middle class, into the middle class, expand access to electricity through Power Africa, and support strong democratic institutions. Uh, across these regions, we've got to keep forging partnerships that empower young people, uh, entrepreneurs, students, you know, through programs like 100,000 Strong in the Americas, or the Young Leaders of the Americas, or Yali in Africa, or Yasili in in Southeast Asia. Uh, 
I will tell you, and I think some of you have participated in these, when we have these meetings with young people in these regions, they are hungry uh, to learn from the United States uh, and to partner with us. And we have to not only focus on challenges and threats, but opportunities and hope. Uh, we have to feed uh, what's best uh, in the world and not just uh, try to address what's worse. And finally, with American leadership, we can mobilize more nations as we stand up for human dignity and institutionalize some of the gains that we've been, make, uh, we've been making in development. Uh, given the urgency of the global refugee crisis, for example, we're going to need you to press governments to step up with resources uh, that are needed to, as we prepare for a refugee summit uh, at the margins of UNGA this fall. Uh, we're within reach of the first AIDS-free generation. And we're including for women and girls. So we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, let's see, we've got about uh, 10 plus months to do it. Um, I have to tell you, though, that I'm confident that we can make significant progress over these next 10 months. Um, I think over the last three and a half years, people have been calling me a lame duck, and somehow we've gotten a lot done. Uh, and what I always tell my team in the White House, what I tell my cabinet secretaries, and what I want to share with all of you, uh, is we had this unique honor of serving our country uh, at these challenging times, and there are some young people here who will continue to serve our country uh, in various capacities. Uh, in the future. Uh, but for many of us, this is uh, the point at which we will have the most impact, have the capacity to do the most good uh, that, that we may ever have in our lives. What an incredible honor. And what an incentive for us to make sure that we squeeze every last little bit of good that we can do uh, during these times that we're, uh, we're in these positions. Um, and the good news is that when we are focused and true to what uh, made us want to do this in the first place, uh, and when we're true to America's best traditions, it's remarkable what we can get done. That's part of the reason why I could not be more optimistic about the future and America's place in the world. You know, economically, our businesses have created more than 14 million jobs during the longest consecutive streak of job growth in our history. Our leadership in innovation and technology uh, remains unmatched. Militarily, we are the most powerful nation on Earth by far with the finest fighting forces the world has ever seen. No other military comes close. Diplomatically, we continue to set the global agenda. Some of you have participated in international fora, and you know that if the United States isn't right smack dab in the middle of it, uh, if we're not helping to set that agenda, it doesn't happen. People look to us for leadership. Somebody's calling right now to see if, uh, to see if, we, uh, if, we, if we've got the answer to some problem. And because of the values that you and your teams represent every day, because of our commitment to universal human rights and human development and justice and dignity uh, for every human being, people around the world still look to one nation to lead the way, the United States of America. If there's a problem, they're calling us. If there's an opportunity, they want us to help. Uh, 
And the reason they do is not just because of the size of our military or the size of our economy, but it's because of our people. Our diplomatic ranks, our staff, our bandwidth, our capacity to focus and bring to bear our best thinking, uh, that's the thing that truly sets us apart and our ideals. Um, I don't know that there's ever been a country, in fact, I know that there has not been a country uh, that was the most powerful in the world but also saw itself as meeting its own self-interest by advancing the interests of others, that was willing to restrain itself in certain situations in order to build up international norms. Um, I know that in many of the uh, countries where you serve, there are real challenges. And history doesn't always move forward. Uh, sometimes it moves sideways and sometimes it moves backwards. We make gains and then sometimes we feel losses. Uh, and it's typically the, the bad news that gets reported. But I say this to interns that come in every six months uh, and are full of idealism and enthusiasm and are trying to get a sense of how they can channel that and focus that. And sometimes they're beating back the cynicism that's being fed to them every day. And I tell them, if, if you had to choose one time in history in which to be born and you didn't know ahead of time who you were going to be or what nationality, what gender, what race, whether you were wealthy or poor, what, what moment in history would you choose? You'd choose right now because the world's never been healthier or wealthier. Uh, violence has actually ebbed relative to so much uh, of human history. It's never been more tolerant. There's never been more opportunity. And a lot of that is because of the United States of America. A lot of that is because of you. That's a pretty big deal. That makes the sacrifices worthwhile. I'm very proud of you. So let's keep it going uh, and let's finish strong. Let's run through the tape. Tell your families and your teams I appreciate it. Thank you very much.